Okay, thank you very much, Herman Weifels. We don't have that much time left for discussion, but I'll try to at least raise some of the issues that were mentioned. Um, I think everybody here behind the tables was in favor of some sort of developmental agenda which goes way beyond the classical aid agenda. There's a lot of talk about migration, trade, climate change, etc., etc., global public goods, global public bets. And on a theoretical or intellectual level, I think a lot of people will agree and concede that's a very interesting concept. But what does it mean? Maybe we can address this question first. F first of all, um, what does it mean for the actual debate we have in the Netherlands, for example, on developmental aid? Herman Weifels made some severe remarks on developmental aid. Nancy Birdsell, especially for you, I think, this question. Um, you didn't mention aid that much. I mean, we know you are a severe criticist of a lot of the, the, the aid policies in a lot of countries. Center for Global Development every year publishes a list of the different countries and the way they perform on developmental aid. Holland is the, on the first place for the second time this year. Was that the main reason you didn't mention aid that much? Because basically things are all right in the Netherlands? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 you know, every country can do better on, on aid and other issues. I, I guess um, there are two reasons I didn't emphasize aid, although I did try to include it. Uh, one is that Holland does very well. And the second is that I wanted to emphasize those other issues because they are becoming so much and should become part of the development agenda and are less discussed and less seen as part of the development agenda. So it was an effort to insinuate them a little bit more into everyone's minds who's concerned about the state of our global system. Okay. Ha Yong Chang, you didn't mention aid either. You talked a lot about trade, international mm -hmm. finance, financing systems. Was it for a reason? I mean. You're not interested in aid that much, or you don't uh, think it's that no, important? For, or? Yeah, for the reason that I take aid as what it says it is, aid. Yeah? So development has to be done by the developing countries, and it is more important to giving them enabling conditions than giving them money. I mean, ideally I want to have both, but if it has to be one or the other, I think uh, changing global rules is uh, more important than uh, giving them money. Okay. Does it also mean, because it's a very in intriguing thought, that even a country like the Netherlands should make a distinction between their aid policy in a classical sense and start establishing also something like a developmental policy, which is something different? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, as uh, Herman earlier said, I mean, uh, so far the aid mentality has been charity. Eh? Mm -hmm. I mean, these people are starving or look at those uh, poor children not being able to go to school, let's give them some money. Yes, I mean, I'm in favor of that. I mean, I, I think uh, every little helps and, you know, my own country, South Korea, benefited a lot from foreign aid in the 1950s. But in the end, I mean, what is important is uh, that you provide uh, a framework within which uh, they can engage in long-term oriented productive development. Because uh, currently aid is that, uh, more about basic needs and short-term needs. Uh, fine, I mean, I'm not against them. But that, that, that's not the end of development. Development begins with yeah, that. So. Okay. Herman Weifels, can it be a useful, at least analytical distinction to make a distinction between aid and development? Well, you know, as far as I have you know, got an impression of this afternoon, this was one big plea for broadening the development agenda, uh, moving beyond what uh, is our donation uh, uh, in a form of charity uh, to developing countries. Uh, to you know, we have to go through the whole range of issues uh, that we are dealing with, and that is trade, and that is um, uh, differentiation, and that is. Um, 
climate change and this energy policies and uh, that is food policy and that is uh, water policies and, and so global on. Uh, global governance. So that's all part of the wider development agenda. And is it as simple as that? And if we don't really invest in that broader agenda, you know, we will uh, sooner or later be confronted with the negative results of not doing it. I mean, that, that's, okay. that's the way uh, we, we have to look at it. And so my, my um, you know, advice to those engaged in this debate on the future of development policy and development, the, let's say the development budget in this country, is you know, to start looking at it also from the angle of you know, purely self-interest. I mean, that, that's, the, that, that's a pillar, in my view, a future pillar uh, under um, the budget and, and the, let's say, the, the way we are dealing with it. Okay, let's take that as a starting point. On an intellectual level, I think a lot of people agree. But then, what does it mean in terms of how to make policies? Uh, if you take the Netherlands, for example, we talk about the 3D but it turns out to be a highly problematic concept. It's only defense, diplomacy, development. Mm -hmm. We have the relationship between development and trade. We have migration, we have climate, we have the financial system. On an intellectual level, you can connect everything because everything is related to everything. But do you know, Nancy, maybe let's start with you first. Do you know of countries or, who really deal with this uh, in, on a more comprehensive way connecting all these issues to a certain extent, or is it just theory? Well, I think we've, we've thought a lot about this at the center um, because we're in favor of the U.S. having a cabinet-level position for development. And in thinking about it, we've looked at the model in the U.K. of DFID. And it is very interesting. I think it's a sort of conjuntura is the word in Spanish of a set of things happened in the late 90s that led to an approach to development in the UK which really has brought together in a meaningful way uh, the different ingredients that we've talked about today. So that you have uh, a development agency, DFID, which is heavily engaged in foreign assistance but also has a major voice on issues like climate change. Uh, which has, um, you know, participates in a much more fundamental, influential way in interagency discussions of trade, climate change, and so on. And I think that is, uh, you know, it's not easy. Uh, on other issues, aside from aid, the development champions uh, have to cope with the reality that trade, migration, uh, climate policies will be made with domestic concerns as well. They're, they're, you cannot isolate them as a development mm -hmm. issue alone. Uh, but the experience so far in the UK I think is quite interesting and I certainly hope that in the US we can move in that direction. And you've okay. seen the leadership I assume of uh, you know, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown on, on some of these broader development issues. Hi, uh, Young Chang, you're nodding, but do you know, you, you've talked a lot about trade. Do you know of examples where trade and development were connected in an interesting way? Uh, no, I mean, uh, even in the UK, they are connected, but I mean, in my view, they are connected in the wrong way, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because uh, the, the UK has been part of this, uh, the, for example, EU effort mm -hmm. to push uh, EPA, Economic mm -hmm. Partnership Agreement, which is basically WTO plus. I mean, mm -hmm. it's better than I mean, the, some other bilateral free trade agreements, but still, I mean, the, a lot of uh, developing countries in that are being asked to do a lot more than they signed for in the WTO. And I mean, the, for this reason, the, the, except for the Caribbean countries, the, the, the EPA the countries that uh, in negotiations have uh, refused to sign. So. Okay. so it might be fair to say that we still haven't found a way to deal with all these type of relationships. Herman Weifels, if you look at this issue at a global level, you might say, um, there's also the question how to connect all these issues. I think one of the astonishing things was that in all the speeches, for example, if 
the United Nations wasn't mentioned because if most people, if you ask about global <laughs> public goods, they say, okay, UNDP, United Nations. It hasn't delivered yet what we expected it from, but in due course, maybe United Nations will be the solution for everything, but nobody said that. But if the United Nations is not the solution, what is? The World Bank? Well, so the, first, there is no one solution. Um, I, I mentioned uh, the notion of a global governance network uh, consistent of different parts of different institutions. And, you know, as, as I see it, um, we need, first of all, a body, and, you know, the, the, the most obvious candidate for that is uh, the United Nations, to set goals, and in a way that has been done in the form of uh, MDGs. Uh, so that, that's, I think, a, a role that really belongs to the United Nations. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, um, uh, what I have seen and heard over the last years is that the UN is seen as a impotent body uh, as soon as it comes down to execution. So we need institutions that are able you know, to execute the policies that belong with the goals. And there, um, I think uh, an institution uh, like the World Bank could play a major role if transformed and uh, foreseen uh, of a, let's say, broader mission than just uh, what, what it is today. Um, uh, and in, in, in monetary issues and economic issues, the IMF could play a role, but you could also think of reforming uh, the FAO in a way that it is a really eff effective uh, institution. And uh, maybe um, the um, uh, IPCC should become a real global body um, making sure that we are addressing climate change. Uh, and setting goals there, but also de de designing the right policies to um, balance, uh, let's say, the price of fossil fuels and of the new technologies and uh, to gradually make that transition uh, that is necessary possible. So that, that's the kind of things I think we have to, um, to look at. And um, uh, then a very important issue is that all of these institutions today are seen as um, uh, unbalanced, as biased. Right? So the, the m many developing countries just, you know, distrust the IMF, first of all, but, but to a certain extent also the World Bank, because there is so much vested uh, rich country interest that is playing out in these institutions that these people think, well, you know, we, as long as we don't have enough influence here, yeah, we do not fully trust them uh, as is needed. Okay, Nancy, international architecture. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make the point, it's kind of obvious, but it's useful to emphasize again, that the United Nations, it has legitimacy. And that's why what Herman says makes sense, but it's completely ineffective. The World Bank and the IMF are effective in what they decide to do, but they lack legitimacy. So that sets the stage for some serious thinking about an approach to global governance. I'd also like to repeat something I said earlier today at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I, I agree with Herman on the World Bank, it, and I would go farther further, I would say on global public goods, we should insist that the World Bank take that on, not to implement everything, but to be the center at which as a group of nations, a club of nations, key decisions are made about key strategic decisions about where to go and, then, and policies around that. And in order to make that work, several things have to happen. One is the World Bank has to let go of its 20th century function of making loans country by country. Um, most middle income countries, aside from the next couple of years, if there's a recession, 
really are not needing money from the World Bank in the way that they did in the 20th century. And until that machinery adjusts to that change, well, it will be a problem. Instead, the bank should be told by its members, including its powerful members and its influential members like the Netherlands, that it should set up uh, you know, a department, a division, or whatever that specifically deals with global challenges. So on that, I just wanted to endorse what Hermann said. And I think there needs to come leadership Okay. Can but you, to get the add, bank to move okay, in that direction. Short. Yeah, at one point, I mean, uh, one has to point out that the UN has been, to an extent, deliberately made ineffective. You know, it okay. just didn't happen automatically. I mean, uh, the, there mm -hmm. were quite effective organizations in the 60s and 70s, which have been deliberately weakened by cutting budgets and U.S. leaving that organization and that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's not inevitable that uh, the UN organizations have to be ineffective. Eh? Okay, that's some hope. But if you talk about the 21st century, then Nancy introduced the concept of social contract, the global social contract. Hammond Weifers was very much in favor of it. To what extent is it a useful concept if you talk about developing all these new institutions? Um, if you compare it, and Nancy did that, with the development in specific countries, for example the Netherlands, Netherlands but the same goes for other countries, there is something like a social contract, but there is also something like a social contract because there are powers in balance, because there were trade unions, because there were organizations of employers, because there were churches who could, could form some sort of form of social contract. But on a global level, who's going to shake the hands of whom? Mm. Well, what are the players mm. to, to form this type of contract? Nancy? Well, I think we have a hodgepodge of clubs and institutions now. We have the G20, the G24, the G8, the G10, the G3, the G2. Um, we have the World <laughs> Bank. We have the Bank for International Settlements. We have the Basel Accord. We have... 20 or more United Nations agencies. We have the IMF, we have the World Bank, we have the regional development banks, etc. Is that a et comforting thought or a uh, We have thought? a stew, we have a hodgepodge. It's okay. I think that there can, we need some redundancy. Uh, Bob Zellick called it um, the Facebook approach to uh, multilateralism. Um, so I think the issue is really. Uh, First, to get better representation of key developing countries in, in the institutions that have clout, mm -hmm. uh, that have resources, um, to put more resources into some of them, but in a way that reflects better power and influence of China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Africa, and so on. And, and we see already the change from the G8 to the G7 to the G20. So I, I think that the we're in a very interesting moment, frankly, uh, on global governance, and it is really a central issue in a way for those who are concerned about development, because the policy space that Hayun talked about and the ownership, country ownership, that Herman talked about will come via these institutions. I, I would also say that the, the institutions are important because they lock in good behavior they have the potential anyway to lock it in that everyone has to play by rules that everyone has agreed on in a way that the G7 doesn't in itself. The Financial Stability Forum doesn't because it's mostly now a set of G7 countries. So I, I think it's going to be messy, but some of that messiness is what creates the openings for in, yes, some incremental improvement, not necessarily grand new institutions, but incremental change that's led by countries that get it, like the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, Herman Weifels, you, in the Netherlands you have a history of bringing about social contracts between actors who are not part of government. And in the Netherlands you've always seen that as an essential part of bringing about the social contract. What would it look at? on a global level, not looking just at governments, but at other actors as well? Well, what no, it mean? I think, I think an um, important force um, 
already now and for, for quite some years and, and certainly going forward is the whole group of NGOs. Uh, I, have, I have sometimes, you know, labeled the, the um, consolidated uh, position of NGOs in terms of that is the only force in the world that is really going for the common interest. Uh, more than business, uh, which is about self-interest, largely speaking, and in many cases also governments who are uh, supporting especially self-interest. So th th that's uh, an important force, that is, that, that is one. Uh, but secondly, in my view, given you know, the enormity of the challenges we have before us, lots and lots of peoples, and also of government, will you know start looking at what can we do you know to address these issues uh, and the best way you know to organize yourselves and in this case it is at the level of the global community that is creating institutions that have the duty you know to do just that to look at the glo at the at the planet at the world as a system that has to be managed in, in certain ways, because that's the point we have reached. And I think that's the next stage of development of our society. You could maybe even say it's the next stage of evolution. <laughs> I mean, this, this is really something big we are talking about. And I, I tend to look at it in terms of, uh, we have to, you know, to create a new culture, we have to create uh, new technologies, we have to create new uh, governance systems, uh, and that um, adds up to, you know, a next stage in development of our societies, if not in, uh, in evolution. Maybe you could say, what, what is building right now is the creation of a planetary consciousness. And that means that we have to move in a way also beyond one of the basic notions on which our societies are built, and that is social Darwinism. The survival of the fittest in economic terms, and, and also between nations. And we have to move beyond that, at least partly, because we have to care for the common interest. And that is not about the survival of the fittest, it is about the survival ultimately of the species, of life itself. Mm. That's at stake. Okay. And that's an evolutionary step we have to take. Hi, Young Chang, then. Um, th then what is the significance on having some sort of contract or maybe even institutional norms on a global level? Because your talk was mainly about mm -hmm. don't listen to the Washington institutions, develop your own policies, Look at China, it worked out all right. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people might say, okay, it worked out all right to a certain mm -hmm. extent, but mm -hmm. they neglected all sorts of norms in terms of environmental policies and other things, and we have no clue how to bring them in those type of debates. Mm -hmm. So no, no, what, I think, what, what, what uh, is the role of norms in your theory? No, no, I think uh, we need uh, some norms, but uh, you know, the trouble is uh, we are talking about many different issues. Countries have different needs, they have different capabilities. And what I find uh, problematic is uh, this attempt to have one rule that applies to everyone, regardless of you know, historical justice, their circumstances, their abilities. So you, you need uh, a more kind of uh, diverse approach, you know, what uh, maybe could, I mean, I have said this thing so many times, uh, I'm, I'm fed up with it, but you know, it still needs that uh, repeating that what works for one country doesn't necessarily work for others. What is right for one country is not necessarily right for others. But uh, so far, the orthodox approach has been, you know, we have this uh, that, uh, set of policies that, yeah, maybe it doesn't 100% work, but uh, works most of the time. And if you have any uh, dissenting view on this, uh, you can go away and uh, leave the planet uh, kind of uh, approach. And. <laughs> You know, I mean, like uh, we value biodiversity, we need uh, intellectual diversity. You know, I was in a meeting in Finland uh, last week uh, with uh, the CITRA, the Government Innovation Agency, whose uh, new head is a former kind of uh, the top uh, director of Nokia, and he said, you know, one reason why Nokia succeeded was we had terrible uh, diversity profile in terms of 
the usual things. Uh, yeah, there was only one lady, and there were like a nine you know, or eight Finnish men of similar age, all from similar universities and so on. But he said that the intellectual approaches could not be more different. Yeah? One was a philosopher, another was an engineer, and we fought all the time. Yeah? And that's the strength of Nokia. So that we need something like that for the world as well. Sounds like a WRR. Um, <laughs> <laughs> final question. I mean, because we're running out of time. Um, the role of the Netherlands, or the, more general, the role of small countries. A question for the three of you. Start with you, uh, Aung Chang. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were very polite and very nice, saying, OK, you've had your history, you've, you've shown that you can do things on your own, you're tall, etc., etc., etc. But <laughs> honestly, I mean, this is a nice intellectual debate, but is there any room for something like a Dutch policy in this respect, if we connect everything to everything and everything has become global? No, no, I, I think uh, there is, because, uh, you know, like it or not, you know, the still the national states matter. And, you know, frankly, you know, I, I come from a country whose uh, biggest uh, pride is uh, having been invaded uh, more times than anyone else in the world. You know? <laughs> you know, I mean, one of our school textbooks used to start by saying in 2000 something years of known history, we have been invaded something like 1,455 times or something. <laughs> and we are still here, you know. I mean, that, that, so I, I understand that, that this uh, small country mentality I mean, we are, in terms of population, bigger than the Netherlands, but still, I mean, we are, uh, compared to our neighbors, pretty small. And for, you know, small countries always have uh, wariness about large countries, yeah? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, as a good Korean, I'm worried about uh, China becoming stronger, yeah? Mm -hmm. You know, one reason why we cannot have Asian integration in the way that uh, you can have uh, European integration is because there is no counterweight to China, yeah? So the people are afraid of that, but on the other hand, the Asian integration with China will be a joke. Yeah? Without mm -hmm. China, will be a joke. Yeah? So you need uh, this uh, critical the, 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 the brokerage role for, I mean, the, the, uh, that can only be played by some small country with good track record for being independent. And so then I, I think the Netherlands, together with two or three other European countries that uh, can play that kind of role. I don't know, maybe I like this country too much. Huh? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Nancy, um, you can have a debate on the role of the Netherlands. You can even have a debate on the role of the EU. One of the things that struck me last week was there was on the internet the report the National Security Council presented to President-elect Obama, briefing him on, on the new developments in the world. It was the small version, there's also an enlarged version that was not on the internet, it was only for Obama's eyes. And it showed this new multipolar world and <laughs> explaining what India is doing, what China is doing, etc., etc., etc. And basically what it said about the European Union was, well, there are a lot of people there, they have an economy, it's hardly growing, but Obama, don't pay too much attention, they're all tied up in their domestic quarrels, they don't, can, they can't make any real power, forget about the European Union. So I'm not only asking about the Netherlands, I'm also asking about the European Union. What, 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 what does it mean for small countries to have a sort of policy if everything is global? Mm -hmm. Well, in the, in, when you asked the first question of how you and I wrote down two things, so I'll, I'll say what those are. I think they kind of go to your second question to me mm -hmm. about Europe. The first thing is that um, small countries like the Netherlands have experience and lessons for the developing world, which I think you could better reflect in your approach to development policy. And let me use the example of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I've said this in other fora. The economy of Sub-Saharan Africa added up across 48 countries is smaller than the city of Chicago's economy. Mm. And it's certainly smaller than the country of, than Holland's economy. It's about Belgium, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so. You look down upon the Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> so, Netherlands has learned to be open and has been an open economy. I wouldn't want anyone to interpret the discussion of asymmetry, that countries can choose different policies, to mean necessarily that there aren't some lessons for small economies in the experience of Europe in the European Union and of Holland in the global system. 
if Africa doesn't deal with the high cost of its borders and open up trade at least amongst the countries within Africa, it cannot grow. It absolutely cannot grow. So there are some principles, even as there should be more allowance for differentiation across countries, there are some principles about what works where. And I would emphasize that the Netherlands should stand for the benefits if you organize yourself reasonably well and you have a domestic social contract, the benefits to your people of uh, trade and openness. Now on the European Union, I think there's also a tremendous lesson. Uh, this isn't maybe so interesting for you, but the US last year for all of Latin America, the aid that went from the US to all of Latin America excluding the drug business and so on and in, in Colombia was about $400 million. The European Union transfers, did transfer to Ireland, I think $10 billion over five or 10 years and is currently planning to transfer to Poland similar amounts. I mean, it's this is, this is an approach to convergence which is seen in Europe as being in your interests. There's a lesson there for the US. Uh, it's astonishing really since Poland and Ireland were already closer in a convergence sense to the economies of Western Europe than are Mexico, Honduras, Nicaragua to the economy of the US. I don't think I answered your question, but it's kind of a plea <laughs> okay. that you continue to take leadership in terms of the influence you can have in the way the world uh, sees the Netherlands and the way the world sees Europe. Uh, the US in that intelligence report may have seen Europe as, you know, arguing with each other. And I have to admit, when I was at the Inter-American Development Bank, the Europeans were not as effective as they could be because they had trouble agreeing on things. Mm. Um, I think <laughs> that was 10 years ago, maybe it's better now. But on the other hand, Europe and the integration and convergence policies really capture something that is so important for developing countries. Mm. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is, in the United States, we should be using examples for Africa, what would it be like to be in Rhode Island <laughs> <laughs> if, you if you didn't let people cross the border mm. to Connecticut and Massachusetts? What would it be like to have a savings and loan crisis in Texas if there was no larger setting uh, for transfers and for short-term help? Mm. That's, that's a lesson that ne the Netherlands and Europe have for the developing world. Okay, thank you. Finally, Herman Weifels, after spending several years at the multilateral organization, you're much more modest about the possibilities of the Dutch government and Dutch policy? Well, no, no, not, re not really. Um, the f first of all, you know, in my, in my view, if I have, you know, I do remember something of my history lessons. This country has played a substantial role in any stage of globalization. That was already the case in the um, 17th century and even before that, that we were probably even a leading country at that yeah, point in time. You invented the East India Company. Yeah, right? absolutely. We invented, in fact, capitalism. Mm. Um, <laughs> Um, so, and, and also in, in, in subsequent stages, also looking at the creation of the European Union and so on, we have played, um, let's say, uh, roles far beyond the size of this country. Uh, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have that ambition, you know, to, to keep on playing a serious role in the international concert. Uh, I think that, that that's what we really should do. And we have, of course, in this country, you know, some 
reactionary forces uh, that kind of are inward looking, uh, but uh, I get the impression that they are a bit on the retreat now. So we should, you know, really take up our role. And in that sense, it was good that our prime minister was also present as the 21st um, participant at the uh, conference uh, recently held in Washington. Oh. Huh? So it was the, the big, uh, the G21. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With, um, featuring Mr. De Jager. So that, so that, 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 that is one. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so, and then, uh, you know, uh, going back to my experience in the World Bank, uh, what we did is, you know, to create uh, a group of like-minded uh, EDs in our case, um, including uh, the UK, you mentioned that, that, that example, but also the Nordics uh, and sometimes Germany. Uh, and we could really influence um, what happened uh, on the board of the World Bank. Yeah? So uh, if you uh, really try to find, let's say, the right uh, group of people to you know, uh, influence uh, the debate uh, at different levels, there is uh, potential for, for influ influence. And then let me also briefly um, comment on the European Union. You know? I'm still... Um, and maybe I'm a rare animal now, but I'm still a Europe optimist. Um, when you look at um, the development of the European Union, and I've been involved in it since the mid-60s, it is a tremendous success. Uh, of course, it is also a procession of Echternach. Eh? Uh, there is problems uh, all the time, but we move ahead. And that means that intrinsically, this is a very strong concept. Uh, we are making progress gradually in almost every domain. And it is not a weakness that sometimes, you know, we disagree. Uh, and this report you were referring to is looking um, at... Um, let's say, uh, in this case, the European Union, from a geopolitical and military perspective. And indeed, you know, we don't have almost anything to bring to the table when it comes down to the military. But when, you know, some of the notions I have advanced here today are true, are right, what are we going to fight about? I mean, uh, mm. having this strong military, these huge investments in the military in the U.S. is 5% of GDP. You know, if, if Obama is on the lookout for, you know, some resources, he, he might, you know, look over there. But, uh, so, so, you know, th th that is the kind of world vision we also have to develop. And we have to move beyond this notion of that we are fighting against each other. Uh, for the resources of the world, because we, the main thrust of our uh, operation in the future should be the pursuit of common interest. That's what it is about. And I think we as a country, also with our tradition uh, of dialogue, uh, of um, uh, finding common ground, of, um, uh, let's say, debating uh, and then uh, finding a common solution, that is in the DNA of this country. And that's what we should bring to the table also globally. Okay, they're great concluding words. The final word is for the chairman of the WRR. Thank you very much. And these are indeed uh, words of thanks. A few years ago, there was a very nice book edited which was talking about globalization and human dignity. Afterwards, I think we are moving to a concept of globalization that Herman Weifels put it very clearly on the table is about human destiny. And the debate gave us some clear insight in the necessity of human agency or ability to, to construct new ideas of governing our world, our planet. And I think that perhaps some comfort can be taken out of the insight from historians, I'm glad to have one in the council these days, that only when we look in hindsight to the formation of the state, this looks like a very clear, a very um, smooth process. Actually, it was not. It was also a hodgepodge of trying to work for the bonum commune, for the common will, 
Um, I think we can be optimistic, certainly when we have the Dutch genes, in order to arrange such a new configuration that might very well look like the pictures I have shown in the beginning of this session. Well, I'm not going to conclude otherwise than saying these few words to you, thanking you for being with us today, thanking for being guests of the Scientific Council of Government Policy, which just, and you have found it in your documentation, produced your new working program for the next years. And in these programs, you will find ideas for next lectures that, of course, will again invite you to be with us for intellectual debate, inspiring policy with the help of good research in order to improve the quality of strategy making at the governmental level. Thank you very much, Peter, for chairing the debate. And thank you very much, Herman Weifels, Nancy Burchill, and Oyu Chang for being with us this afternoon. Excellent speeches, excellent input in our debate. An extra applause for you. So we have earned drinks, and I just want to say this. The WOR is a great team. The council, the staff, the support staff, a very small little organization that has made this possible. As a chairman, I'm very proud of that institution, and I just want to ask you a final applause before going to the drinks for all the support staff that has been working uh, the last weeks to make this possible. And I especially thought to Jan. <laughs> and Herma, who is not here. I invite you to the reception, which is in the meeting where we had a coffee, the, the, the room where we had a coffee. Thank you.